let's get started. Thanks for coming, everybody. My name is Don Rice. I'm the board president here at the Dyken Farmhouse Museum Alliance, and I've um, been giving history talks all around the neighborhood for a number of years now. This is different, though. We've heard, as soon as I moved to the neighborhood, I heard about the uh, Revolutionary War history about the neighborhood Fort Tryon, just the whole name of the park says Fort. So you wonder what that's all about. And um, kind of intimidating because that seems like hard history, like real history that academics do. And I'm not an academic historian, but I have been a researcher all my life, despite of everything, in spite of everything. Um, so after about 10 years of learning how to research, I felt like I was ready to tackle this. Um, the sources that I've used, I've tried to use as many primary sources as possible. I've tried to use um, diaries, diarists, memoirs. I've tried to use government resources, primary documents there, like foundingfathers.gov, um, Forces Forces American Archive Series, which is multi-volume papers of the revolution, um, the Continental Congress records, the New York Congress records. And then a myriad of texts that have been published since then, including Reginald Cullen Bolton's uh, Washington Heights Manhattan's eventful past and local texts and stuff like that. What this talk is going to be about is the run up to the Battle of Fort Washington and its immediate aftermath. So we're going to start at the with the rumblings of the wars. Hi, Bill. The rumblings of the war is coming, and we're going to lead up to a climactic battle in November of 1776, and then the quick chase across New Jersey. And, and then in August, we'll talk about, part, we'll do part two, which is the rest of the war. We're gonna be doing four talks this summer on the back porch. Um, they're, either, they're usually the, the third Thursday, but next month, uh, our archeologist, Dr. Bill, Dr. Bill Perry, William Perry will be here to talk about the Lenape, in the neighborhood. And I encourage you to check the calendar and uh, attend. Then in August, I'll do part two of this. And then in September, the final talk of the summer, I'll do my annual history of the Dykeman Farmhouse talk, right. which grows every year as we find new stuff. And, if, and there is new stuff for this year. I found an 1895 map with the farmhouse on it, the earliest red ring on a map we've ever seen. So it, which helps resolve some architectural history questions too. All right, let's get started. This map shows the neighborhood in 1775 and 1776, where it's an agricultural neighborhood. We can sort of see farmhouses along the Harlem River, and we can see that the main road, Broadway, um, the Kings Ridge Road, comes closer to the Harlem River instead of the route that it has today. As we zoom in, Zooming in right, yeah. We can see the plowed fields of the Dyckman Farm and a few other farms. There are only a few farms up here. And Spite and Dival Creek winding around. Marble Hill is, is there. <laughs> so it hasn't been uh, carved away from the island by the Corps of Engineers yet. And then some lead up events, Boston Massacre, March 5th of 1770 and the Tea Party in 1773 helped to uh, raise everybody's blood pressure a little bit, including in New York, as these feisty colonists kept annoying George III. And he wrote, George wrote on March 7th, 1774, Parliament will take measures to put immediately immediate stop to the disorders and secure the dependence of the colonies upon the crown. He's not gonna take any guff from us. And Paul Revere's ride to where? Kingsbridge, right? Kingsbridge? Yeah. <laughs> we think of Paul Revere's um, ride from Boston to, now it's slipping my mind, of course, but um, he did in a year before, he put in for pay for rides to Kingsbridge. So he was doing some different messengering. And in May 28, 1774, he put in for reimbursement for a journey to Kingsbridge, 234 miles from Boston. 
I think that's just fascinating. You did it on one voice? I have no idea. That's the only record. It's just uh, putting in for pay how he did the ride. And in 1775, uptown neighbors start to take sides as we start to see that there is a battle that, that might happen. There might be a war that's happening. And the, the Phillipses and Yonkers side with the Crown and the Van Cortlands um, in Kingsbridge sided with uh, Independence. And so at a, at a meeting on April, in April of 1775, they had a spirited argument with two sides in a meeting for appointing deputies for the Revolutionary Convention broke down into a neighbor versus neighbor kind of conflict. Lexington, that's where Paul Revere was going to. And so uh, in April, 1775, this event happens in Massachusetts where uh, the British arrive in Boston and Revere rise to Lexington to say how they're doing it. When news of Lexington and Concord reached New York, New Yorkers started moving all the heavy artillery that was down at Battery Park up to King's Bridge, out of the way, almost in a, an attempt to hide it in case the British showed up and just quickly claimed all of this artillery, which would be very valuable to them. They started moving all of these cannons up King's Bridge Road, through this neighborhood, across the King's Bridge, and in, uh, a, in a mem memorandum from April 30th, as we can see someone wrote that great numbers of people are employed hauling the cannon from the city to Kingsbridge, 14 miles where they will immediately entrench. And in May of 1775, the Continental Congress ordered that forts be built of, at Kingsbridge. This is sort of in fear, I think, of the British using their superior force of the navies to use the waterways to just sort of surround the island and take everything over. So they wrote, resolved that a post of, be fortified at Kingsbridge to prevent the disruption of communication. It was the only land route on and off of Manhattan Island, after all. And resolved that a post be taken on each side of the Hudson River to prevent vessels passing. That ended up being at Fort Lee and at Fort Washington. Resolved that the mil militia of New York be armed and trained and in constant readiness to act. And so in looking forward to this uh, uh, militarization and enlisting soldiers, they needed a commander in chief. So June 19, 1775, John Hancock gives uh, George Washington his commission. We appoint you commander in chief of the army of the United Colonies. You are hereby vested with full power and authority to act as you shall think for the good of the service. When George Washington got that letter, he was on his way to Massachusetts. And see, as he stayed overnight in Kingsbridge, this is from the founders.gov, he stayed overnight in Kingsbridge on his way to meet the army that he was going to take over. And he wrote to the New York Congress, he wrote, while I deplore the necessity of such an appointment, I cannot but feel the highest gratitude for this distinction. May your wishes be realized in the success for America. Every exertion will be extended Ray, the establishment of police and peace and harmony, and we shall rejoice when American liberty shall enable us to return to our private stations in a free, powerful, and happy country. Powerful words to write from Kingsbridge. As the cannons keep, you can't just drag all of these heavy artilleries up overnight. It takes several weeks to do it. And, um, on July 23rd, they counted 280 pieces of cannon that had arrived in Kingsbridge from downtown. And August 23rd, 21 more nine pounders were hauled up. So man, what does that mean? 20 a day or maybe, maybe not even. That's a long way because they weigh a lot. More news from the King. He vows to suppress rebellion to bring traitors to justice, to make known all attempts against us. But he's not the only person who can uh, <laughs> uh, go viral, I guess, right? <laughs> Thomas Paine publishes Common Sense. Uh, you may think of it as the first viral mass communication event in America, you may. Could say that, I suppose. He sold 120,000 
copies in the first three months. And he writes, among many other things, government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil, in its worst state, an intolerable one. And the cause of America is in a great measure the cause of all mankind. Does not mean that everybody has good intentions because January of 1776, they found that all of the cannons they had dragged up town had been sabotaged. They had had a spike driven through the touch hole or just a railroad spike or a file. And uh, if, if it was blocking the touch hole, you couldn't fire it. The touch hole is where the gunpowder would go. You'd have light a, I don't know if you needed a fuse, but you can imagine where you would take a fuse and touch it to powder it would go down and light the main charge. He was a, if you actually, you could see the person hammering it in, there's the butt of the cannon there. And this is a statue that someone commemorated this event with. They hired a guy and it took months to fix. But was William Tryon behind this? Um, one person seemed to think so in an interview with these suspects said, Mr. Burrell spoke to the governor who said to render those cannon useless. Governor Tryon advised him to destroy them and because it would save the city and prevent it from being burnt down. And if it was done, they would be paid well for it. That kind of is incriminating. <laughs> so it's possible that uh, Governor William Tryon was the instigator of this sabotaging of the, of the cannons up in Kingsbridge. And the Continental, the Provincial Congress writes on May 14th of 1776, the next six months are gonna be hugely eventful, by the way, resolved in order that all male inhabitants be employed in the fortifications of the city, drawing one third from the commanding officers poor, one third from the male inhabitants of the city, and one third from the Negro men of the city, all and conscripted to build forts uh, all over the island, but that would include Upper Manhattan. They shall take spades, pickaxes, shovels, hoes, etc., and be under regulations, pay, and provisions of the militia. Was the Negro men free men or slaves? I can only say what the words were, um, so I'm not sure. That more research might be able to uncover more of it, more information about that. By the way, some of these quotes I've edited for brevity. Okay, so the kind of the writing that had kind of been on the wall about the British maybe abandoning Boston. The uh, rebels had the upper hand uh, in regards to the harbor, and uh, eventually the British gave up. A guy named Rufus Putnam was the architect of North Manhattan's forts. And he writes in his diary, on my arrival at New York, I was charged as chief engineer of laying out and overseeing works for Washington, Fort Lee, Kingsbridge, and obstructions in the river. So let's talk about some of these things that he, how did you make a fort in the 1700s? Not so much uh, steel available or reinforced concrete, but fascines, these bundles of logs and sticks, would be quick barricades, you lash them together, they're portable, you can move them around and they sort of make something you can hide behind and shoot over. And if they're thick enough, they're sort of bulletproof. And abatis, were like the barbed wire of the 1700s, in the absence of barbed wire, cutting down trees, putting the sticks in the direction they think people are gonna come so that when you're trying to get past them, you're sort of trying, you have to, you're delayed by getting through these sticks and brush and thorns and gabions are baskets filled with earth and those would be totally bulletproof once you, you move them into position and then fill them up and then they make a wall george washington writes to john hancock on june 20th i have been to king's bridge and find several places well calculated for defense Esteeming it of the utmost important, I have ordered works to be laid out. This is Washington's tent. It's the Valley Forge Museum. So for an itinerant general, he probably spent a lot of nights in that tent if he couldn't find a better place to stay. And this is what Kingsbridge looked like 200 years later around, well, 
or in around 1900. Yeah, but New Yorkers really weren't just gung ho about the New Englanders about independence. There was a lot of mixed feelings in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, the financial world of New York was uh, not so interested in wartime. And uh, John Adams wrote in June of 1776, he goes, what is the reason that New York is asleep in politics and war? Have they no sense, feelings, passions? While every other colony is advancing, New York's motions seem retrograde. Even New Jersey, New Jersey shows noble <laughs> ardor. Is there anything about the air or soil of New York that's unfriendly to the spirit of liberty? Are these people destitute of reason or what? <laughs> you can hear, I could hear a guy saying that today. <laughs> All right. Um, so Washington, you know, he has to start telling New York that get ready, get ready. The British are probably coming here. So he goes, the time is now near at hand. The fate of unborn millions will now depend on the courage and conduct of this army. Let us therefore rely on the goodness of the cause, the cause for independence. It's often just called the cause. And the aid of the supreme being. The eyes of our countrymen are now upon us. And... Come July 12th, the British do start to arrive. The British Navy starts to arrive in New York Harbor. The fleet begins landing at Staten Island, which was more pro-King than any of the other areas around here. More pro-King than Brooklyn or New York Island. York Island is what they often called New York Manhattan. The Howe brothers were the commanders. Richard commanded the Navy. William commanded the Army. So this is going to be our sort of scorecard. We're going to periodically show how the British took over Manhattan. And as things get further, more and more red, by the end of the year, it's all going to be red pretty much. But we'll see that by, by like July, as soon as the fleet lands in Staten Island and is basically unresisted, Staten Island becomes under British control. The forts uptown, there's, a, there's even more incentive to finish them quickly. Um, here's some art. Here's some correspondence between Mifflin and Washington, saying he finds the works at, at Fort Washington advanced, but not in a state of defense yet, not ready, not wartime ready yet. We can see these features of forts, bastions and bulwarks that come up in conversation. And they're talking about how uh, Fort Lee is taking shape. Fort Washington today, you can find it on the site of Bennett Park. And in the pavement, they've outlined some of these bastions and bulwarks in brick. So you can see in the pavement, kind of, I guess, inlaid into the uh, uh, tarmac, the shape of the fort that's on the, on the site of the playground. That's the summit of Manhattan Island. And July 9th, the Declaration of Independence was read to the troops in City Hall Park. And according to the Journal of Solomon, Solomon Nash, three cheers were given after it was done being read. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. And then they rioted. <laughs> Soldiers, you know. Um, just a few hours after the Declaration of Independence was read, the statue of King George III in Bowling Green was toppled and decapitated. And uh, in the Journal of Isaac Bangs, he writes, in the statue were 4,000 pounds of lead to be made into musket balls for the Yankees. It is hoped that emanations from the leaden George will make deep impressions in the bodies of some of his Tory subjects. <laughs> um, but that was the body and the horse that Actually, the tail of the horse is still at the New York Historical Society, and sometimes it's on display. But the head disappeared. The head was rescued by a Tory and ended up impaled atop a flagpole at the Bluebell Tavern on 181st Street. Right. The Journal of John Montresor, who was a loyalist, said the rebels cut off the king's head and nose and otherwise disfigured it. It was carried to Moore's Tavern, Blazes Moore and his son adjoining Fort Washington in order to be fixed on a spike 
on a flagstaff. I sent my men to Kingsbridge to steal it and bury it. And then I rewarded them and sent the head to England to convince my colleagues there of the ungrateful people of this country. Sort of like, that's very symbolic, sending the king's head back to England. Anyway, now on June, July 12th, the flagship finally arrives with Admiral Howe. And the first thing he does is send two British warships up the Hudson, strafing the city with their cannons. In the afternoon of July 12th, the 44-gun Phoenix and the 20-gun Rose stood boldly up the North River. And as they passed the city, their guns opened on the town and shocking scenes of panic and distress resulted. But there was a little bit of a twist to the story because unaware, they were unaware of the new forts being built at the top of the island, unaware of the batteries at Tippett's Hill and Cock Hill, the ships anchored near the mouth of Spite and Dival Creek, and American guns opened on them and did great execution. So they didn't sink any of these ships. These were very, very sturdy, strong battleships, but they sure were surprised and they realized that they couldn't just walk in and do whatever they wanted. So now we can see the first of these images that I've been able to find from in a, uh, the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. These are more drawings by Thomas Davies. Thomas Davies is, a, is a, an artillery man for the British. And we've seen one or two of his drawings before, but this is a new one to me. And if you, rec you probably can even recognize what it is, this is Inwood Hill. And that's Spite and Dival Hill on the right. So we're almost at the, at the uh, foot of 218th Street. And there's probably the Phoenix or the Rose right in the middle of the river with the Palisades behind it. The caption reads, view of the entrance from Kingsbridge into the Hudson's River. Okay, we can go quickly through some of this stuff, but in July and August, there's many, many diary and journal references to the building and the staffing of the working construction of Kingsbridge. 150 men to Kingsbridge on July 7th, 300 men on July 19th, another 150 men with three drums and fifes to go up to Kingsbridge, 150 men on July 21st, so hundreds and hundreds of people working on these forts. And time is actually starting to run short because they only have a couple months before the battle takes place. So these satellite fortifications, we often talk about Fort Washington. Fort Washington isn't even in this view, but all of these forts were to protect Fort Washington. They're actually reinforced even more by the British after they took over forts one through eight. Um, this became Cock Hill Fort. That's Forest Hill, became Fort Tryon, Fort George. Well, that's Fort George is down here, Fort Number Eight, and Fort Independence up by the uh, Jerome Reservoir. Some of these sites have historic markers on them that you can see today. Fort Number Four, Fort Independence, and to can, and to sort of uh, prevent the British from just running willy-nilly up the river and firing at whatever they wanted, they decided to try and put a barricade across the Hudson River at Jeffrey's Hook. They called it a chevaux de frise, and it was conceived to obstruct the Hudson by burying or sinking a lot of junk ships across the river, strung across with cable, huge, huge cables, to try and actually just put a tripwire across the river And that is right at the Jeffrey's Hook. Here's a map from 1900 or so that shows the line of the sunken vessels from 1776. And another map. Oh. And another map that actually shows it going across to Fort Lee from Fort Washington. And of course, it was not a success. We'll find out that story soon. The Hessians arrive on August 8th. So now the British forces have all of their fighting men in place. Sort of in an attempt to get back at the Phoenix and Rose, these ships that had flung these cannonballs at the city, rebels tried to sabotage them by light, catching them on fire. 
this fire ships incident off the coast of Spiten Dival in August, where they laded, filled some junk ships with flammable materials under the dead of night on a moonless, foggy evening where you couldn't be seen by starlight or moonlight, loading with the tide against these ships that are being repaired and trying to catch them on fire. And they were partially successful, but they were able to get some of the uh, uh, ships that were supporting these battleships, not the main ships. So they, it was proof of concept, but uh, didn't do the thing they wanted, didn't fill the objective, the object that they wanted. So Washington says, well, the writing's on the wall, not much time to go. August 17th, he says, I, I recommend to all people, if they value their own safety, to remove with all expedition out of town. And on August 18th, the deserter showed the British how to get past that barricade across the Hudson River. Because of course the Americans need to use the river, so there has to be some way to get by. And apparently it was right here, right by the Little Red Lighthouse. It was a little open area. And the British took advantage of that. And they break right through the show. On August 18th, the Phoenix and the Rose and two tenders stood down the river, keeping close under the east shore to avoid the fire of the cannon. They were hauled, of course, and damaged. And even some men were killed, but they, they proved that all this effort was uh, not enough to stop the British. Here's this. Is this gonna start automatically? Dominic Serra wrote, drew this great oil painting. You can see the cables splashing across the water with bits of sunken ships poking up. And here's the British forces on the New York side, pushing their way through the entrance. And on the far right, we'll see the, the guns of uh, the Redoubt at Fort Washington. Even a flag. General Heath proposed a pontoon bridge across from Dykeman Street so that these satellite ports would, would be, there would at least be a second way to get to them except for the King's Bridge or the Dykeman's Bridge. So this is another access route. British offered amnesty for people who changed their minds. If you, if you were a rebel, but now you want to be on the side that's going to win, we'll take you back You just sign a loyalty at loyalty pledge. Deliver yourself to headquarters and you'll be received as a faithful subject of the crown and given permits to return peaceably to your dwelling. This is the only slide we'll show about this, but the Battle of Long Island in Brooklyn, August, late August of 1776. And of course the routed American forces had to, this famous retreat by night, across the river to avoid the whole army being captured. So now that's a huge swath that suddenly turned red all of Long Island. At this time in Kingsbridge, rebel des deserters were becoming a problem. And of course, uh, uh, the general up here, he threats to Washington as the numbers of militia are going off without license, I desire you to stop them at Kingsbridge. One deserter was arrested with a cannonball, which he said he was taking home to his mother for the purpose of pounding mustard. $30 reward has, says the New York Gazette and Weekly Mercury from August 19th, 1776, $30 for Isaac Potts, John Weaver and John Westlick. They deserted at Kingsbridge about two weeks ago. And in August, late August, the evacuation of North Manhattan begins. Around the 31st, 
the inhabitants of Kingsbridge began driving their cattle to the interior of Westchester County. This would have been the Dykeman family too. And they had to soon because the roads were going to be uh, chopped up and made impassable. People played around with the idea of destroying the city by burning it so that the British would have nothing as a reward. George Washington writes, if Congress should resolve upon New York's destruction, it should be a profound secret. And then Congress replies, we came to a resolution that no damage should be done to the city, but then private debate afterwards, like between Nathaniel Green and George Washington said, well, privately, I would burn the city. So Washington ordered the breaking up of Upper Manhattan's roads and building an Abatis barrier across Broadway or across the Kingsbridge Road at that time. September 8th, Heath, Heath, General Heath was instructed to fell trees, fell trees of the neighborhood across to, and put them across the road towards Kingsbridge so as to make them impassable. Talk, talk, talk. So the British want to talk. So there's a one-day peace conference on Staten Island, of course. And Benjamin Franklin is one of the negotiators. And uh, William Howe is a negotiator for the British side. And really, William Howe actually thought of uh, New Yorkers as brother, but like a familiar family kind of, you're, we're all the same family. And he even said to Franklin, if America should fall, I should lament it like the loss of a brother. And... Uh, Bon repartee, Ben Franklin says, my lord, we shall do our utmost to save your lordship that mortification. <laughs> you know, that's his way of saying no deal. <laughs> All right, Manhattan invasion begins, but downtown. September 15th, 32,000 British troops invade at Kipps Bay, that's around East 34th Street. And so we can see the progress being made here. Lower third of Manhattan is now under the British command. George Washington moves his headquarters to the uh, Roger Morris house, the Morris Jumel. He stayed there for a couple of months. In September, the Battle of Harlem Heights, Washington almost had a victory. He forced the British to temporarily retreat, but fell short of it's anything decisive. This is a nice sketch. Okay, so now it's getting it's getting to be go time, really, for the Battle of Uptown. The middle third of Manhattan was taken. And then suddenly, out of, I mean, just sort of randomly, kind of right after they were talking about building, uh, about burning the city, the city, half a third of the city burned, or several dozen blocks of the city burned in the Great Fire of New York, September 20th, 1776. There's some new scholarship that I read recently where there, is maybe if there's some more evidence about people deliberately setting it, but there's also not as, enough evidence to be conclusive. So what happened is not clear to me anyway. Uh, we haven't really talked about Fort George, but on October 6th, they requested to build a small fort there. And all of these forts are supposed to help each other out. So Putnam and Knox write to Washington saying they viewed the hill east of Mount Washington and they'd like to build a fort there. Okay, I put this in just because it's so crazy. But for a short time, Kingsbridge, in around right around then, Kingsbridge is renamed Congress Bridge. And there are a couple of documents that support it. In Chaplain Andrew Hunter's journal, he said that he wrote to Congress Bridge with Colonel Portland. And the general expects attacks every day. And here's a receipt for pork and flour from Congress Bridge. And then the Rosetta Stone that sort of tells you they're talking about the same bridge is in Benjamin Trumbull's journal saying on October 15th, General McDougall's brigade are ordered over Kings Bridge or Congress Bridge.
And so now the British just go across the Cheva de Vries whenever they want. Shots, they, they, people are going to die, but not many, because they sort of know how to do it now. And so in October 9th, they forced another passage through the Cheveau. And while they were doing that, they accidentally destroyed a battle submarine. <laughs> battle submarine. Battle submarine in the Revolutionary War. A, a one-man sub called the Turtle. It was sort of experimental. It had had two missions. It was being either prepared for the next mission at, at uh, Fort Washington, um, and it was transported around on a large craft. So it was actually a mortar craft that was sunk when the British passed through the Chevaux de Frise. And it was called by Major General Heath, the machine. And in his memoir, he wrote on October 9th, the enemy sunk a sloop, which had on board the machine invented by Mr. Bushnell, intended to blow up British ships. This machine worked underwater. It conveyed a magazine of gunpowder fixed under the keel of a ship and then freed it and with a clockwork like a fuse, which was to explode when the machine got out of the way. So this was a, a submarine that had an oil reservoir to help it float and rocks to help it sink so that you could get some equilibrium. It could go underwater maybe two or three feet it was powered by a bicycle pedal that attached to a propeller and it held one person and it had a, a screw or an awl that could drill into the hull of a ship. The first time they used it, they didn't realize that some British ships were clad with copper and it, it, the, the screw couldn't go through the copper and so the mission failed. The second time, the guy surfaced too soon and was seen by someone on deck and there was no third mission. but they were thinking. And so now the British can go up and down the river however they want. So we'll call the Hudson River part of British territory now. Um, Washington had to have word coming from everywhere, news coming in from all over the place. The war wasn't only happening in one place. And so uh, in a case of mistaken identity, his sloop was, uh, caught under some friendly fire on October 11th opposite Kingsbridge in Fort Lee on a foggy day. Washington's barge, which had gone up a river, had attempted to return and they didn't, people didn't know where they were, it was foggy. Um, they saw something move and they fired at it. Washington wasn't aboard, but several of the crew members and people who were serving Washington were, were killed. And the, the description is quite vivid. So now that we start to have all these armies in place, of course they need supplies. And Congress gave Washington authority to appropriate from Westchester Farms, which becomes a big part of the, the later story of the war. The, uh, the neutral ground of Westchester County. On October 14th, on October 14th five tons of gunpowder. Um, October 14th again, troops of Westchester can go and purchase cattle. The troops can go to Westchester and purchase cattle and grain and straw. But things don't look good because the British can actually do what they want. Washington calls a council of war and decides to evacuate New York Island with the exception of Fort Washington, which will be maintained under a strong garrison. And so the satellite forts are all evacuated, really abandoned. All of the strength is going to be in the Fort Washington, Fort George, or trying um, on Manhattan kind of reinforcing reinforcements. So on October 28th, they withdraw from Fort Independence. <laughs> General Green inspected it later and found several hundred rifles still there and spears and shot and stuff. So to carry these off so the British wouldn't just get free ammo, he impressed all the wagons in the neighborhood and dismantled King's Bridge and dismantled the Free Bridge. And October 29th, Colonel Lasher bent, burnt the barracks at King's Bridge and he left all the cannon in the fort. Oh, this is the final thing before the battle, Battle of White Plains. 
since now, October 28th, the Battle of White Plains, another thing that didn't go well, we could see up in the northern part of Westchester. Now, the upper part of Manhattan is pretty much, aside from New Jersey, surrounded. But it is surrounded because the Hudson River is also um, something that the British can control. So now all we have is southern Westchester and upper Manhattan that are controlled by the American rebels. The Hessians immediately moved towards Inwood. October 30th, 1776, General Knipphausen took over abandoned Fort Independence. And during the first week of November, he started to repair the King's Bridge and the Free Bridge so that his troops could cross over. And one final inspection of Fort Washington found it a little bit lacking. John Cadwallader and Alice Graydon visited the fort and wrote in their dark journals that there were no barracks, fuel, or water within the within the fort. It was an open earthen construction, no outworks or defenses that could entitle it to the name of a fortress capable of sustaining a siege. In addition, there was not ammunition adequate for the shortest defense. Pretty damning. And then of course, the unhappy soldier decides to go to the British and tell the British how many soldiers are at Fort Washington, who's commanding it, what the strengths are, where would be the best place, where the weaknesses are. A man shows up, this is the diary of Frederick Mackenzie. On November 3rd, a man says he was an adjutant of the rebel army and deserted from Fort Washington. He says the rebels amount to about 2000 men at the fort. And if they are obliged to abandon their advanced works are to retire, the strategy is to retire into the fort if your exterior defenses have been defeated. They have two months provisions, he says. A lot of cannons, a lot of ammunition, kind of the opposite of what the uh, people said just a few days before. He says they are in much distress of clothing. So General Knipphausen, Hessian, readies his defenses on the Dykeman Flats and the nearby hills. And pretty much the rest of the talk is gonna be a description of this battle. On November 3rd, Kinnipausen and six Hessian battalions passed to North Manhattan, to Manhattan Island yesterday without a shot being fired at them. So the Hessians didn't all come from outside Manhattan. They were up here in the flats with Isham Park, a nice hill, kind of hiding them, defending them. They were amassing in this neighborhood, getting ready. If you, if, I mean, if you go by the guy's journal entries. Colonel Rawls on November 4th, Colonel Rawls Brigade marched to Kings Bridge with their regiments that had just come from Germany. We awaited to learn when the attack was going to be, when Fort Washington should be taken. So Washington says, um, well, should we leave? November 8th, he says, I'm inclined. It wouldn't be prudent to risk the men at Fort Washington. He's writing to Green, who's uh, in charge of the fort. He says, I'll leave it to you. And George Washington, uh, rather Green, replies to Washington saying, I can't conceive that we're in any danger. The men can be brought off at any time. The enemy seemed to be getting ready for a siege instead of a battle. Hindsight is 2020. There's no way he could have really known. Hessian Captain Wiederhold's diary actually talks about how the battle with date was decided on. And on November 18th, he wrote, at five o'clock in the morning, our entire division marched out to attack. But then a violent rainstorm set in and we had to attack. We had to abandon the attack for this day. And then three days later, they got orders for a new date to attack. General Howe arrived with the entire army. Now another plan was made. November 16th was fixed upon for the attack. Here's another great image from the Gallery of National Gallery of Canada. This is actually pretty sure it's Isham, viewed from Isham Park. This is was uh, according to the caption, it's two days before the battle. Which makes me think that if a draftsman could come up and just do a military drawing, that, that it lends a little credibility to the Hessians saying that they were staging their attack from Manhattan. 
This is called, the name of this is called A View of Fort Washington Rebel Redoubts and Part of the Harlem Creek, 14th November, 1776. So that's two days before the Battle of Fort Washington. This one we're gonna take a closer look at. We can look at some of the things here. The thing that I think tells me that it is Aisha Park are the glacial erratics that are very clearly drawn. And if you look at them today, they're close to what they might have, they're almost, they look almost the same. Harlem Creek on the left, you can, you can see a little bit of the New Jersey Palisades on the right, so that you can locate Fort Tryon, Fort Washington. Here you can actually see some of the earthen works and Fort George. And you can see a couple of rein, reinforced uh, battle areas there. And of course here, this is a hill along Post Avenue that's been just leveled for apartment buildings. Now we'll take a closer panoramic look at it. So automatically start. There we go. So we'll take a close up look at, the, at this view because this is an image that has probably not been seen very frequently. It's not on the internet. This is Fort George. This is around Post Avenue. There's the Dykeman Pastures east of Broadway. Fort Washington, the top of the hill. Let's keep going. These huge boulders that in this neighborhood are only on top of Isham Park. Fort Tryon today. Here's the deforested land that was possibly torn down to make that abatis across the main road. And the New Jersey Palisades and on the far right, that's Inwood Hill. We actually see a little bit of it. Beautiful drawing, dug from life right on the site. It's just two pages of a sketchbook. I don't know how big the sketchbook is. What would a sketchbook? We could, I could find that out. No, I'm sure the museum like has the dimensions. It's not like it's like somebody like you kept it, like a little thing, right? It wouldn't be like a giant. Thing. That's I'm worth finding out. Sure. November fifteenth, the day before the battle, the Americans were given a chance to surrender. A short time before noon. Howe invites McGaw to surrender, a mounted officer under a white flag, British, ascended towards Mount Washington and bore a summons to surrender and required an answer in two hours. McGaw answered after, of course, he wrote to his people. Then he wrote to uh, the British person, I am determined to defend this post to the very last extremity. So the Hessian soldiers receive their battle flag. There's no surrender, so tomorrow we fight. Orders arrived, says the diary of Johannes Ruber. November 15th, orders arrived that Fort Washington should be captured with four attacks, three English and one Hessian. It's very interesting to find out all this stuff. I mean, it's not super well known from the layperson's point. And um, if you look up all the forces that fought, there are artists that like to draw uniforms that are historically accurate. And so if you, if you see the uh, historical list of forces that fought, like the 17th Regiment Dra Dragoons or the Herb Prince um, Hessians, you can find people who've drawn their uniforms to, so you can get a general idea of what these soldiers looked like. There were Scotsmen in kilts fighting in this battle. And for the uh, rebel troops, the American forces, a mix of uniformed and non-uniformed soldiers from Maryland, from Virginia, from Pennsylvania. Okay, it's battle day, November 16th, it's go time. 5.30 a.m. before daybreak, two Hessian forces cross Kings Bridge, at half past nine in the morning, we passed over King's Bridge in two columns, writes Wiederhold. At seven o'clock, a violent cannonade began 
to divert the attention of the enemy so that they should not know where the real attack was being made. So ships, the pearl is offshore and cannons are on, in the uh, University Heights and they're all blasting away to sort of cause some confusion so that the Americans would fight against the cannons, but the cannons weren't the real attack. Colonel Rao's forces in blue drag a howitzer and a cannon atop of Inwood Hill and point it towards Fort Washington. So this massive artillery wake-up call to the battle from seven to nine, it could be heard all the way in downtown Manhattan. Chavez Fitch's diary, he wasn't in the battle. He was in downtown. In his diary, he wrote, early in the morning, there began a severe can cannonade up to northward, which we heard for the great, greater part of the day. So here was where the cannons are shooting. Cannons start shooting from the howitzer and cannon on Inwood Hill, from the battleship in the Hudson River, from this Post Avenue redoubt that they built, and from University Heights. making a heck of a noise. And then around 10 a.m., the main attacks begin from the north, east, and south. So we can see Colonel Rall, the, the Hessians attack sort of from one direction towards the fort, Kinnephausen and Rall. Americans, Rall, and are in, are in orange. And then here are the British attacking from, all, from three sides. And here's the painting that we've seen before from Thomas Davies. A lot of us have seen this before many times. This is from the day of the attack, showing, showing the British arriving in barges. Fort George, Fort Washington, the Inwood Dyken Flats. The old Dyken House alongside the Harlem River. And uh, Fort Tryon, slightly different view. And now we can see Hessians marching on the far right with the battleship in the Hudson River. So we're gonna zoom in to the lines of Hessians. I actually believe this is a painting that Thomas Davies did later that he made a sketch on the day of the battle and then finished a painting afterwards. It's hard to believe he would be thinking about what color of blue to use when all the cannons are blasting around. Here are the orchards around the Dykeman and Nagel homesteads. You can see soldiers, British soldiers firing. Kenneth was the hero, was one of the heroes. And you can see his, on his timeline how he eventually got to Fort Washington. And he was a soldier, soldier. He could always be found in the thick of the action, says Captain Buterhold. He tore down the Abbasis with his own hands. He was exposed like a common soldier. It's a miracle that he came off without being killed. And Buterhold writes that he was halfway up the hillside when Kenneth sent an order to wait because the tide wasn't right for a, some attacks over here. So hold up, you're, going, you're actually being too fast. You're doing it too well. We have to wait for everybody and coordinate. Biederhold wrote, we stood facing the riflemen who were on an inaccessible rock surrounded by swamps. And in spite of this, the earthworks were broke through, the swamps were weighted, precipitous rocks were scaled, riflemen driven out, and we gained a terribly a terrible height and pursued the enemy. Colonel Rowell did the same thing. All of his regiments marched forward up the mountain over stones and rocks, which tumbled down. One man fell down alive, another man fell down dead. This is what he wrote in his diary. We had to pull ourselves up the wild boxwood bushes and could not stand up properly. It sounds like a, a mad scramble, really, against uh, with people shooting at you. 
So that at the tide, a rather maybe misunderstanding of the tide delayed what was a decoy attack meant to draw American fire from the south, southeast. Trees and big rocks came down and it was hard to get ahead, writes Johannes Ruber. Ruber. Major Rahl said, march. And the drums played, the horns blew, and all of us that were still alive when we got to the top shouted, huzzah, as we ran to the fort. Colonel Baxter on Fort George was killed very quickly, soon after the engagement started, and his soldiers pushed the cannons over the edge of the precipice just to keep them. They didn't want the British to just swivel the cannons around and start shooting big guns at Fort Washington. The uh, a British soldier wrote that the difficulties we had to surmount were incredible. Hills covered with wood and almost perpendicular, and from the fall of leaves in the fall, the footing was insecure. In short, there was everything to favor the rebels. Cadwallader and Graydon, who had uh, written that criticism of Fort Washington, were captured in the south, in the south front here, ended up in a barn being held in a barn at the Morris Jumel mansion. And he said, there was nothing left but to give ourselves up. An officer put us under the care of a sergeant who said in broad scotch, young men, you should never fight against your king. And a British officer rode up ex exclaiming, kill them, kill every man of them. I took my hat off to him and said, sir, I put myself under your protection. And his manner instantly softened and he met my salutations with an inclination of his head. Then a Hessian came up and said, hey, you rebel, John rebel. I like this. This is almost like a conversations of stuff that's happening. And uh, finally, Alexander Graydon wrote about, writes about being in, in prison temporarily that day, that they were 20 times told, we were 20 times told that every man of us would be hanged. And then he sort of loses his composure. He says, the indignity of being ordered about by such whipsters unmanned me, and I was obliged to apply my handkerchief to my eyes. These youngsters, and we're professionals. Anyway, um, we were moved to the barn of Colonel Morris, and here were men of all descriptions, American captured, captured Americans, some in uniforms and some in hunting shirts, the mortal aversion of a red coat. So what, where was George Washington while this was happening? He was watching it. And during the battle, he and three generals were nearly captured because he was on the Jersey shore watching this take place. And as events started to happen, he thought, I need to, this is early in the battle. I, we need to talk, I need to go there. So they get in a barge and Green writes in his diary, November 17th, this is he's writing the day after. Yesterday morning, Washington, Putnam, Mercer, and myself went over to determine what was best to be done. The instant we stepped on the boat from New Jersey, the enemy, enemy began, began a cannonade, and the enemy advanced while we were crossing the river. When we got across, we found ourselves in a very awkward situation, he writes. His Excellency, His Excellency thought it would be best for us all to go back, which we did about a half an hour before the enemy surrounded, surrendered the fort. And he, re, he also remembers to write, it goes on the north side of Fort Washington, there was heavy fire for a long while. But what was going on on the north side of Fort Washington? Margaret Corbin, Corbin was doing her hero turn. At Forest Hill, Margaret Cochran Corbin fought beside her husband, John, clearing and loading the cannon between shots. And after he was killed, she took over his position firing a cannon and was eventually badly wounded. It nearly severed her left arm and severely wounded her jaw and left breast. She was unable to use her left arm for the rest of her life, says Deborah Michaels in 2015. At the, after the surrender, she was paroled and taken across the river for medical care. Supreme Council of Philadelphia on June 29th, 1779, granted her $30 and recommended her for a pension, a soldier's pension, which she was granted, being a soldier's half pay and the value of one suit of clothes every year until she died. 
And there's a plaque in Fort Tryon Park now for her. So this is sort of like now the defeat. As the rebels run into the fort, um, says an English officer, as the rebels ran into our fort, our men stood laughing at them as they passed, crying, make room for real soldiers. Boom, teasing, bad mouthing. And uh, another, another uh, diarist writes, a Scottish 42nd Regiment backpiper killed at Fort Washington. One of the pipers who began to play when he reached the summit was immediately shot and tumbled from one rock to another until he reached the bottom. It's almost funny, except it's a tragedy. So George Washington had tried to go over to the site early in the battle, realized that he couldn't actually make it to the fort without um, putting himself in danger. So he went back and watched the rest of the battle from New Jersey, but he wanted to send a message about how the battle should end. And when it looked like the British would win, Washington sent a message across the river to McGaw, instructing him to try to hold out until, until night, until nighttime, when he would be able to, under shelter of evening, try to save some of the troops. So Washington writes later to John Hancock, he sent a message to McGaw directing him to hold out and I would endeavor this evening to bring off the garrison. Heath wrote that the messenger was a guy named Captain Gooch. Captain Gooch ran down to the river, jumped into a small boat, pushed over the river, landed on the bank, ran up the fort and delivered the message. Then he came out, dodging the Hessians, some of whom attempted to thrust him with their bayonets and escaping through them, he got to his boat and returned to Fort Lee. This is like last minute daredevilry. In just in an attempt to say, let's make a plan, because now it looks like we need to try to save you guys. This is what it would have looked like, because Washington, the this ferry that uh, was below the Palisades, the Palisades actually temporarily sort of stop below Fort Lee. And then they come back, come back around Midtown. So this is low lying area closer, and this is a ferry that used to fly across the river up to Jeffrey's Hook and back. What's really cool is you can see Fort Lee. This is one, another one of the uh, Davies drawings from the Museum in Canada. This is called A View of the Hudson Taken Near Fort Lee Landing Place in 1776 by Thomas Davies. So this he would have made probably after the battle was over, maybe in December. But Fort Lee, the top, and probably Fort Tryon and Inwood Hill and Spite and Dival, and you can actually see, maybe this was zoomed, and probably not. There's Fort Washington there, almost seen it from the, on the level. You can see that, and the and the reinforcements, the rifle redoubt of Fort Washington, of below Fort Washington. Are we going to zoom in? Oh, we are. Great. That's probably Spite and Dival. And that's Fort Washington. And that would probably be Fort Tryon. And that would be Inwood Hill. Uh, we could probably figure it out if we wanted to. It's actually a photo of that that you can find online of that structure. It doesn't exist anymore. What a location for Fort Lee, that's incredible. So the remaining troops retreat within Fort Washington. Washington is reported to have wept when he saw the site of this unequal contest. Colonel Rao sent one of his captains in uh, the journal entry. He says, he quotes himself, Holstein, you speak English, take a drummer with you. 
tie away cloth on a gun barrel and go to the fort, call for surrender. Okay, and um, whose diary is this? Oh, it's too small for me to read. The rebels led us to a colonel whom I made the proposal that they should immediately march, march out of the fort and lay down their arms. I allowed him half an hour to speak with his officers. When the half hour was passed, his fate seemed hard on him. He said, the Hessians make impossibilities possible. The English took more than 2,000 American troops away into prison camps. And uh, after it was night, an order came in from the English camp that the fort, according to the Journal of Johannes Ruber, that the fort, Washington, should be called from thence on Fort Knifthausen. An order came from the fort that the fort should be called Fort Knifthausen. About 2,800 American soldiers were captured. That was just a huge blow. And what made it even worse is that over the next 18 months, before exchange, enough exchanges could happen, many, um, many died, more than half. The Hessians grudgingly respected the American fighting style. Juan Minigrode's diary says, they lie behind trees, bushes, stone walls, and rocks. They shoot at long range and with certainty and run away very fast as soon as they fired. The Germans cannot shoot a third that far and still less catch them on the run. And so now we can sort of see how it's going to, how this story ends tonight. You can see, Lower Westchester, Upper Westchester, and all of the rest of New York and the Hudson River under control of the British. Then, of course, people start to blame the boss. General Reed writes to Charles Lee just a few days after the battle both the plan and the defense and the execution were contemptible. If the defense of the lines were intended, the number of troops was too few. If they wanted to defend the fort only, too numerous. An indecisive mind is one of the greatest misfortunes that can befall the armies. They're second guessing Washington here. And here's one a letter from Charles Lee, a candid letter from Charles Lee to George Washington on November 19th, saying, Oh, General, why would you be over persuaded by men of inferior judgment to your own? So, the Americans sort of thought that that was the main goal, that now that Fort Washington was taken, there might be a little break in the hostilities for a little while. But just four days later, on November 20th, Cornwallis took Green and the Americans by surprise by attacking Fort Lee. Howe ordered Cornwallis to clear the rebel troops from New Jersey without a major engagement and to do it quickly before the weather changed for the worse. And so, this has a, the, the ferry was at Yonkers and you could actually climb the Palisades at Yonkers. So some soldiers took boats and some marched. And there's another Thomas Davies drawing of the soldiers climbing from um, Cluster, Lower Cluster Landing. That's where the Alpine rest area is now and the, and the, uh, and the dock. Troops climb the New Jersey Palisades as we see here. One diary, one British diarist said, the rebels fled like scared rabbits. They left some pork and some of that common sense man's letters behind. This was such a surprise attack that then it was early in the morning, the troops, some of the troops were in the middle of breakfast when the order came to quickly retreat. The Americans barely escaped. And Thomas Paine happened to be serving in the army at Fort Lee there. And in his next publication, which is a series called The American Crisis, in American Crisis Number 1, he writes, I was with the troops at Fort Lee. We brought as much baggage as the wagons could contain. The object was to save the garrison. And now we can see the final picture of the story today. James Fenmore Cooper wrote in that novel, The Spy, 
Sir William Howe fell back to the enjoyment of his barren conquest, a deserted city. And to finish off the talk for tonight, we'll read a little, just this last quote of Thomas Paine, where he says, these are the times that try and souls. That's a well-known quote. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink from the service of their country, but he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. So just to let you know what would happen in the next couple of days, on Christmas Day in 1776, Washington crosses the Delaware. We've heard that story. And he has some good, um, may, maybe not major battles, but some wins. He has some wins at the very end of the year and, and the first few days of January in 1777. So, of course, we know how the story is going to end. But at the end of 1776, things weren't looking very good. And this, this neighborhood played a big role in, uh, at least in how it all went down. I mean, we could have wished for some a better outcome, but um, very exciting to go through all these soldiers' diaries and things. If anyone has questions, I think that's the end, right? Yeah, that's the end. So thanks for coming tonight. Uh, find me if you have questions or if you have a question now. Okay. Yeah. One from the live stream. From the live stream. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, well, I want to thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I grew up in this neighborhood. I live in Bangkok, across the street from Bangkok Park. Uh, and I rode my bike up to Dobbs Ferry um, on the Putnam Trail. And I was wondering if Rufus Putnam is the same Putnam Trail is named after. And the significance of Dobbs, I know it's a little farther north than here, but did the American soldiers retreat to Dobbs Ferry? Or what was Dobbs Ferry's role in all of this? I think that Dobbs Ferry is going to be a bigger story later. Um, the American soldiers that didn't get captured retreated down south along New Jersey shore. But the whole of uh, Westchester, after the British took over, became sort of this uh, neutral ground for the next, for the Drake until the war was over because of its great natural resources for food and supplies. So we'll learn more about that in August. Yeah. Well, where was Hancock? Oh, you mentioned that Hancock set the papers hiring Washington as the leader of the army. What was Hancock's role itself, his in, position? In Con Continental Congress. So the governing body that would hire the soldiers and give them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not New York, but a uh, Nash. Yeah. Oh. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Okay, a question for the live stream. Um, could you repeat the name of the person who you drew those sketches, the, the two page sketches from the Canadian Museum? Thomas Davies. Thomas Davies. Okay, I hope they're satisfied. <laughs> um, then, oh, and this closing image is one of his drawings too. I should, I can't read the title off of it, but it is another one of the images from the gallery. The other thing would be. Was he just an artist? Was he a, a soldier who also drew, or what was? Here's what I know about him. Um, he was, I think, from London. He um, was an artilleryman, and for some of the duration, part of the reason I think we have these sketches from the neighborhood is because he was uh, uh, one of the off artillery officers at Fort Knipphausen. So he was here the day of the attack of Fort Washington. And then he maybe immediately, or maybe not immediately, but he ended up being back in the neighborhood as an officer of the artillery for a while. Um, but his artwork is from all over the place. He served all over the place as a soldier. Canada, Mediterranean, the Caribbean. And um, so a lot of his works are from really all over the, not all over the world, and some of his works are like naturalist works of plants, of uh, uh, birds, 
of just ships, like the architectural, how does a battleship look when you're up close to one, things like that. Um, I've only seen, not all of his sketchbook is online, almost none of it is. So there's a lot to still learn about him. I know that he died in London. So he wasn't killed in action. He survived the war and he made it back to London before and maybe lived a long life. Uh, we probably do know when he died, but I can't think of it. I think he's a really talented artist. The perspective is really good. And the draftsmanship is very clean. And, it, and it, he's very successful, at least in my mind, of bringing uh, my mind's eye to the place that he's, he's trying to draw. Yeah. There's an illustration that showed Aisha Clark Ross. Yeah. That are there today. And to the left of that, it shows Fort George. But isn't Fort George a Dykeman Street now? It's to the right. They were north of Aisha Clark. They're looking south. So Fort George will be on the left. Okay. So perspective that there, the illustration shows Fort George on the left and Fort Tryon on the right. Should we go back to that? I don't know how we can find it. Yeah. There. Okay. So imagine I'm at the traffic circle at Park Terrace east around 214th street where you i mean that doesn't, street doesn't exist there but that would be about north southwise where it would be Aisham park going down to the a train to the left to broadway going down to park terrace west and seaman avenue on the right inwood hill right heading over to the Harlem River. So you've got different hills here that Broadway comes down the center of, Fort Tryon for Washington on the west, and Fort George on the east against the Harlem River. Yeah, I, I get it. the perspective. Yeah, this is a perspective, a point of view that I've never, I haven't seen before in a drawing from this era, but it all, I mean, you know why? The other day I was in Aisha Park and I was sitting on a bench and I could see those rocks looking at yeah. this. But this is much more north looking south. Yeah. So we would be like at the entrance of Aisha Park or maybe even at 215th Street where you're looking up to the rise of Aisha Park. And then, uh, but these uh, glacial erratics are pretty solid for me, look pretty solid for me. And um, from his other drawings, like here with the uh, deforested Fort Tryon, that's in both of the, in his other painting too. So we can, that's in both paintings and the way he drew Fort Washington is the same. And so you can almost take both paintings and rotate yourself around into, a, into the place that this is. It would be nice to see some color because then you could see the, if the water were a different color, then you could really start to, but it, the more you look at it, the more it snaps yeah. into focus. Any other questions? You said, you said that he was a naturalist and did botanical, Thomas Davies was a naturalist and did botanical studies as well. Some of his works are with plants and birds. I mean, and, I'm struck by, the drawings you showed, you can, I'm a landscape architect, I can definitely tell plant material, types of trees. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Uh, the date of the next talk is July, July, 20th. July 20th. So the, the date of our next talk here is July 20th. It'll be with uh, Dr. William Perry, who is here in the back. I really look forward to your talk. So um, if you like this kind of stuff, we could see you four times a summer for talks like this. Thanks for coming.
I mean, I really feel like I'm like, in it. <laughs> What's going to happen next? What's going to happen Back next? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I,